welcome back. I have an amazing guest who has an awesome, awesome bio and history and a great new book to share with us, uh, Stephen Hartoff. Stephen, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Appreciate you having me on. I'm glad to be here. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the books. I got them. I got one behind me, as you can see on the shelf, and I got another one sitting on the coffee table, and I can't wait to dig into it. It's on my it's on my pile now at the, at the top, so it'll be uh, next up after I finish this uh, Mark Greeny book. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll take second to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, let's talk about you a little bit. You got a very interesting history. I'm reading your bio. Um, Born in New London, Connecticut, eventually went and joined the U.S. Merchant Marine Military Sea Lift Command. Um, what was behind your decision to do that, join the Mer Merchant Marines? Well, you know, I, I sort of became enamored of adventure writers when I was a kid. Um, my mom, uh, God bless her, she just passed at 96 years old. One of the first things she ever gave me besides the Hardy Boys, you remember the Hardy Boys? Did you read the Hardy Boys when you were a I kid? Did. I did. Yeah. Well, after that, my first adult book was The Guns of Navarone. Okay. So she sort of, she skipped over from, from 10 years old to 25 and handed <laughs> me The Guns of Navarone. And after that, I was just reading all of these Alistair McLean books and stuff. And I sort of came to the conclusion, I, I think I knew that I wanted to be a writer, but I also knew that the, the writers that I admired were also adventurers. You know, they, they wrote about places they'd been to. They mm -hmm. wrote about yeah. things they'd done. They weren't writing their books from somebody else's experiences, but their own. So I don't know. I went off to college and after two years, I said, nah, I, I can't stand sitting in a classroom. So I went and joined the Merchant Marine. So what was and, that like? uh, well, where'd you go with, with them? I was like 19 years old, 20 years old. And <laughs> it was like something out of a Herman Melville book. I mean, these guys, these old salty sailors were, some of them were in their forties, fifties, you know, there, and, and we were on an oiler refueler from world war two and we were carrying JP five, to uh, U.S. bases around the world to, you know, to juice up jets. So we went everywhere. In the South America, we went through the Pan Panama Canal, we went all across Europe, we went through the Med. Um, I learned what it means to be seriously seasick. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I was the kid on the boat and uh, I would get, you know, in really heavy seas in the North Atlantic, I would get so sick that they, they'd assign like, a couple of the big sailors to, to hold on to my shirt when I was out on the railing and, you know, make sure I didn't jump overboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah grab this kid. <laughs> this kid looks really sick. He might dive in, you know? <laughs> so, uh, that was my first taste of real adventure. A Connecticut kid to, uh, you know, merchant seaman. It was pretty cool. So from there, you kind of caught the adventurous bug. Cause in 77, you volunteered for the Israeli, Defense Forces Airborne Corps as a paratrooper. Yeah, that was really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I say that jokingly because, you know, you've been in the Air Force. You know what it's like. I mean, you yeah. you know, what what you picture in your mind and what actually happens are two completely different things. So yeah, you got to be careful what you volunteer uh, for. Oh, totally. Never <laughs> volunteers. <laughs> Never. Yeah. <laughs> So I, um, I don't know, I became enamored of that. My mom was a, a, a refugee in, from, from Nazi Austria. So, and I, when I was in the Merchant Marine, I wound up in the Middle East, wound up in Israel, sort of fell in love with that whole Lawrence of Arabia thing. And then when I got out of college, I said, I'm going to go do that. I knew a couple of, you know, Israeli paratroopers and I figured, oh yeah, I'll get in. And I did get in. And, uh, that's when the pain started, but yeah, I was in there for, I was in there for quite a while. Yeah. What was it like being, being an American in a foreign unit like that? You know, Jeff, it was like being in the foreign legion and back then now it's kind of common, you know, you see a lot of Americans over there joining and it's sort of like a rite of passage thing, but man, back then in the seventies, it was like being an American in the RAF at the beginning of World War II. Just a few here and there. 
Uh, you know, everybody thought I was crazy, you know, like, what are you doing here? And I, I had learned the language in a language school, but you know, the language, your street language and your military language are completely different. Mm -hmm. So I went off to basic training with the Israelis and I didn't understand a word they were saying to me, yeah. even though I was fairly fluent. It was like, <laughs> I just did what everybody else did. So it was like being in a foreign legion, it really was. And, and the conditions back then were foreign legion type conditions. Our basic training base was an old Arab Jordan legion, bunch of cement barracks, no windows, no heat, uh, you know, freezing in the winter and 110 in the summer. Ah, yeah, that's rough. But you stuck around for a little while because you eventually went over to military intelligence. What, what was behind that move? I, they came and got me. It was okay. one of those things where, you know, they recruit from elite units and, and they were looking for, at the time, um, foreign, quote unquote, foreign uh, soldiers who could blend in, you know, as non-Israelis into various environments. And I was, you know, I just got asked to volunteer and then I went through a long, uh, you know, a vetting process and a Q course and, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, so I just, I went with the flow. I figured this is cool. You know, I'll yeah. try this now. So, uh, so I did that too. But then after, after all that, and then I was in Lebanon for the war for a couple of tours and I went back to being a reserve paratrooper after that. I didn't, I didn't stay with that unit. Okay. So what, uh, you eventually you know, got out. 13 years with the IDF and then um, task force commander rank of major uh, with the New York guard. How did that happen? Same sort of thing. Like I'm back here. I was living here. Uh, you know, the same story. A lot of us have nine 11 and you go, I got to do something. Yeah. And uh, I tried to join. <laughs> I was, I was old by then, you know, and uh, I tried to join various various National Guard units and that sort of thing, or I can't remember all the people I approached. And uh, I finally settled on the New York Guard in New York State. And, um, you know, they sent me to OC OCS because my background, and uh, I wound up running this unit up at Stewart Air Force Base in New York. It was on the Army side, and I had a small unit of, a small task force of of army folks. And I did that for quite a while. I just retired about a year and a half ago. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Now I'm done. That's it. No more now uniforms. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to take me anymore. It's right. all, it's <laughs> is it, is it weird now? Um, being separated from service. Like I know a lot of my veteran friends and even myself, I had a hard time, um, you know, waking up every day and deciding what to wear. You know, uh, I wasn't wearing camouflage every day anymore. And totally uh, right. You know, that that street language that we talk about, that military language we talk about, it's not as prevalent as it used to be. Is it weird for you no longer kind of being associated with the service? Oh, yeah. Just like it is for you and for all of our, you know, compatriots, men, women who've spent some time in uniform. And, and you know what it is? It's not just the uniform. It's the culture. Yes. Um. Military folks relate to each other in a completely different way, I think. Don't you think, Jeff? It's oh, like 100%. It's it's a it's an unspoken language that's mutually understood without uh you know, a lot of shortcuts, a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot of slow nods, lots of looks. I mean, we've all been through very similar experiences whether or not you've been downrange or haven't been downrange or whatever. You meet another veteran almost of any kind. And you immediately have a connection you don't have with the average civilian and the average civilian does not get you. Yeah. So it's not the uniform. It's the, I mean, the it's uniform is symbolic. Yeah. It, 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 it was really weird after all these years to come to a drill weekend and not get up, you know, at oh dark 30 and put on my, you know, my uh, utilities and jump in the car. It was weird. It's still weird. Yeah. I liken it to, um, you know, the different branches of services, we all joke and pick on each other. But when an outsider does it, we all turn around and say, you can't do that. You <laughs> yeah, know? totally. No, no, that's, oh, totally. that's all right. <laughs> We've earned that. We can <laughs> yeah, pick totally. on each other and we can talk trash on each other. Not you. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. It's, it's, it's still a, that way. It's a brotherhood and a and a sisterhood that is just it's an unbreakable bond. Like you said, when you see another veteran, it's just an immediate thing. You know, we relate to each other, we understand each other on a, on a whole nother level than the average individual does, and it's a uh, totally totally different level. I was in a I was in a store like last week, and I see this fella. He's older than I am, uh, considerably, and he's got a cane, and he's wearing a Marine Corps jacket, and he's got a third Marine, I don't remember what was on his head, and I said, welcome home, brother, because there was something about Vietnam. Uh, There was a Vietnam something on him. I said, welcome home, brother, and boom, we were off and running for, you know, half an hour standing there, and his family couldn't drag him away, and, you know, it's just the way it is. Yeah, I saw a veteran um, much older than me. Uh, in a Chinese buffet one time, he was sitting by himself, and uh, I kind of waved him over, and he kind of waved me off like, "Ah, oh, he didn't want nothing to do with me." And I said, "No, hey, I'm a veteran too, man. Come over and come on, come sit with me." And uh, he came and sat with me, and me and my wife, man, we talked for like two hours, and I just let him talk. He just talked about war stories and his time in, and and how angry yep. he was at some of the new veterans because they didn't understand. And me and him just chatted back and forth. And then I, I paid for his dinner and we left and, and he was That's so awesome. mad. He was so mad at me for paying for his dinner. And I said, ah, it's the least I could do. Thanks for coming over sitting with me. You know, and if it changed your day and it changed your life just for one minute, that 15 bucks that I paid for, like it's, it's nothing. Don't even worry about it. You don't owe me nothing. Do it to the next guy, pay it forward, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. But, but we're buddies. We're friends. I mean, you know, there's nothing that can break that. I, I don't remember his name, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's just that moment, and it was really awesome. And I think that's something that, like you said, it's the culture. It's the friendship. We have something that nobody else can recreate ever. No, that's right. And it's a very small percentage. It is. And I notice also, Jeff, that it, it also depends on where you are in the country, like how people relate to you. I, I noticed that when I was in the Guard, um, when I'd be driving home, like if I was in the area of Stewart of, of the air base, any place I'd walk into, sometimes I'd have to stop people from trying to buy me stuff. You know, like I'd go into Starbucks and the lady who owned it wouldn't let me pay. And I said, you know, Melanie, you can't keep doing this. I mean, it's, I appreciate it, but really let me pay for my coffee or whatever. And I would drive 15 miles and cross the border into Jersey where there was no military bases or anything like that. And I'd go into a Barnes and Noble and I'd get the stink eye from the, you know, from the people behind the register. It's really interesting yeah. how the, how the, our, how the civilians in certain parts of the country relate to military personnel or, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a thing, but I, I wouldn't give up that club. Would you? Oh no, not at all. It was the greatest decision I ever made. And I, I that, have to give that's my what I wife, say. I have to give my wife a little bit of credit because it was actually her idea. Um, and I, and I kind of turned my nose up to it and she's like, let's just go talk some, to some recruiters. You know, we wanted to get married and start a life and all that. I was working at Sears selling refrigerators. She saw the writing on the wall, you know, that's not a career. You know, I get, I got to get this guy wow. focused on a career. So she said, let's go, let's go talk to him. I said, I, I went to the air force recruiter cause my brother-in-law was active duty at the time working on a tens and he was a crew chief. So I called him up and I said, I don't know a thing about nothing. Tell me. And he kind of just rattled off a few jobs. Like, don't go do these, you know? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad he did because as I learned about it, I was like, Ooh, I dodged a bullet there. But um, I went and talked to the Air Force recruiter. I like what he said. I wrote down a bunch of questions. I came back and I said, okay, let's do this. And I didn't want to talk to anybody else. I just, I was sold on what he said. Um, I saw awesome. a future in it and I ran with it. So um in the grander scheme of things, do I wish I would have went and talked to the Navy or maybe the Army? Yeah, I do. I wish I would have at least went and talked to them, but um, I don't regret it for a minute, and it was probably the best decision I've ever made. Yeah, I don't, I don't I, you know, we all have, we all look at other units sometimes and think, gee, yeah, that would have been cool to serve in that. I mean, that would have been cool to, but I, I don't regret a single decision I made in my military careers, anything. And boy, if you've got somebody in your life like that who supports you and wants you to do that and knows what the risks are and thinks it's going to be good for you, <laughs> you can't, you can't buy that. Oh no! And she was a thousand percent correct because I went, I eventually went back to school and I had some really cool assignments and it just really changed my entire trajectory in life and I wouldn't be where I'm at now if it wasn't for that decision. So 
Um, yeah, That's I mean, awesome. I know I know a bunch of other friends that are the same way. You know, the military changed their life, and if we went to war today, uh, they'd be trying to squeeze back into uniforms and signing up voluntarily. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you don't even have absolutely. to pay me. I'll go fight. Tell me where. Right. <laughs> 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 Although not all wars are such great ideas, but you know, we we know we know. Very true. Very I mean, true. Yeah, you go where they send you. Yeah. So let's uh let's talk books. So you've been writing for quite some time now, since like the mid eighties. Um, yeah. Espionage novels, um, first trilogy, uh, the heat of Ramadan. I the heat of right. Ramadan. The heat. The heat of Ramadan. Yeah, there's the original hardcover. Nice. Right there. Right there. That was my first published book. I wrote a whole, I did what all of us veterans do when you, you know, you think you're Hemingway and you come out of the army and you, and you write that huge, that tome that's like this thick oh, yeah. and it never got published, but it was, it was my practice novel. So, and I, I got an agent with it. So that was great. And he was a huge agent. He was, um, do you remember Ken Follett? You know, Ken Follett, the, the British author, huge British author. He wrote the eye of the needle and, at any rate, so I got his agency, and um, then I wrote this book, The Heat of Ramadan, and um, that started my publishing career. And that was a trilogy. Then the next one after that was this one, uh, The Nylon Hand of God. That was the second part of that trilogy. And then the last one was of that trilogy was called The Devil's Shepherd. And uh, th that has recurring, they have recurring characters in them. And um, that went on for quite a few years. Yeah. So that was the beginning of my writing career all through the 90s. So what is your uh, like writing process like? I like to ask everybody kind of what their process is, especially when it comes to writing novels. And that's something I'm trying to get into. Um, you know, how do you how do you start an outline? Like I talked to Kyle Mills one time and he said, you know, when I write an outline, I write like a 20 to 30,000 word outline. And then I just go on, on after that. How do you do it? Mine aren't that. I mean, my first outlines were really long. And uh, my first agent, Al Zuckerman, out of Writer's House, uh, was an amazing guy who, when, I first, when he first took me on, uh, he said, and I was young then, he said, uh, you know how to write, kid, but you don't know anything about writing a book. Mm. And so he, he taught me the outline process, which he used to do with Ken Follett in detail. Every chapter was laid out, who was going to do what, what was going to happen, and so forth. And my first few books, I wrote the outlines that way. They were that detailed. They'd be like 20, 30 pages. Um, and the reason, and I, there, there's a whole argument, Jeff, as you know, especially if you're like in writer's groups on Twitter or whatever, there's a whole argument about uh, outlining or, or seat of the pants, pantsing, meaning just wing it. And I learned early on that, at least for me, if I just try to wing it, I get lost. Yeah. You know, if I don't know what's going to happen in the book, you'll get to a place where you suddenly write yourself into a corner and then you go, now what do I do? Mm -hmm. So now what I do is like for my most recent books is I will write like a two page summary of all the major plot points. And the way I think about it is as if I were somebody else describing this book. So it's almost like a review of a book that hasn't been written yet. Okay. And that's sort of this, you know, Stephen Pressfield, the guy, you know, he's a famous writer. He wrote Bagger Vance and he wrote uh, The Lion's Gate and all, a lot of big books. And he has a theory that and he teaches this, this theory that you have to be able to write your book's plot on one page of fool's gap, one page of lined yellow legal pad paper, you know, mm, like yep. that. And he says, Steve says, if you can do that, you've got a very solid plot. Okay. And then, so after I've got that one or two pages, then I write out a more detailed uh, outline probably a paragraph, you know, a paragraph per chapter. So if I've got 30 chapters, it might be 20 pages. And I'll also put those plot points up on a board and index cards. 
Sometimes I use a whiteboard to keep track of myself. Then I'll say, hey, don't forget that so-and-so got killed in 1932, well, you know, details. Yeah. And uh, that's it. Then I sit down and I start writing. And very rarely do I deviate from what, I mean, within a, within a chapter, I will deviate about how I'm going to approach a plot point, but the plot point is still there. Okay, so not a lot of deviation. No, not a lot. I mean, um, you know, maybe halfway through a book, I'll go, oh, so-and-so should not survive this. You know, whereas I didn't intend to kill somebody off, but then I realized the impact of that emotional point, so I'll do it. But sure, yeah. Yeah, generally, I don't know. How do you do it? What do you do? So um, I, use, I use note cards, and I, and I break out note cards into each chapter, and I write down mm -hmm. on that note card major points of that chapter. And then I like the flexibility of note cards because if I write out a chapter and I like it, but I don't like where it's at, I can just easily move it up and down. You move it around. Yeah. Yeah. And then I take that and I put it into Scrivener, the writing software. And then I create the chapters within that. And I just, you can put little notes in there. So then I have it right. electronically, but I can still, if I like that chapter, but I don't like where it's at, I can just drag and drop it to where I want it. And then I have the functionality to write and then craft the story and move things around as I see fit to draw emotion or to leave suspense or to, you know, to carry on, you know, certain plot points. And, um, as I've been learning, you know, cause I haven't published fiction yet, but I've, I've gone to some conferences. I've talked to some authors like yourself and others, and I've just, I've kind of learned how to craft and there's a difference in making suspense and, and then, creating it you know that you don't want that artificial suspense where you necessarily leave a chapter off on an intentional um cliffhanger sometimes it's appropriate sometimes it isn't but sometimes making right. that suspense where people want to flip the page because they don't know if the answer is coming or if it's coming for another couple chapters and the next thing you know 10 more chapters later they've read it and they understand and they just they're just begging for more so um right for me it's the note cards and then transferring it electronically and being able to just uh, go through it. So I'll have 80 to a hundred note cards cause I'll do one for each chapter and, um, and then I'll just write. And then sometimes I delete a chapter cause I'm like, yeah, you know what? That, that, that's not going to work at all. Or like you said, something organic will come to me and I'll say, Nope, this person's got to go, or this is going to happen to so-and-so. And, -so. and it, it just creates something different. Have you noticed as I have that over the course of time, um, chapters have become much, much shorter because it used to be like when I first started writing, I'd have a 480 page book and it was only 30 chapters. Now a 480 page book could be 70 chapters. Yeah. And I've, um, I've noticed that the thriller writers have really, it's almost like people have become too impatient to sit and read through you know, 10 or 15 pages of a chapter, like they want their quick fix and then they're going to put it down. It's almost like social media impatience sort of thing. Yeah, I have noticed that. And I think you, you have a great point. You know, we live in a society where instant gratis, you know, gratification and satisfaction is, is right here at our fingertips. And that's what we want. Right. Do we just instant, instantly scroll? And uh, I have noticed that, you know, and I, I kind of like that in a way, but I think I like it because of the pacing. I like to be able to read chapters and boom, 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 boom. And it just it has that fast pacing. But I do appreciate ones that have that kind of writing that um, moves you through four or five pages. And it moves you through and you don't feel like you're reading, you know, four or five pages. So, But they are shorter. Like I've noticed that. Like I think I read a book last year that had like almost 90 chapters. You know, and it, yeah, I've, I've seen a it a lot. Two each and it just it just kind of moves through and. Um, I get that, but at the same time, if you have back-to-back -back chapters that are on the same thing, why did you split it up? I, I think it's I think it's a, a response to people's lack of attention span nowadays. It's like you go on your phone and you 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 tap on an article, and it's what's the first thing you see? Two minute read. Yeah, it's like telling right. you, it's like telling you, don't worry, you won't spend too much time getting this information. So people come to expect to, to get their level of satisfaction in a very short period of time. And their attention span 
then has become much, much so shorter. So the problem I think with that kind of writing um, is that you don't have the time to really develop um, time, place, sensation, smell, uh, verisimilitude about an environment. So I, I would caution young writers to, to sort of take the time to let me know where we are and, and let me smell the air and, and, you know, feel the wind and sort of thing. And don't, don't rush through the plot because the impact on me is not going to be nearly as good if all you want to do is, is get me from plot point to plot point. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think something I've done is I've been a student and I went back and reread certain books, you know, and, you know, Brad Thor's first book, you know, um, some of the old Clancy books. Um, I'm a big John Grisham and Michael Crichton fan. And I've gone back. Yeah. We like read, the same people. I've read some of those books and I didn't read them from an entertainment perspective. I read them for how did he move through? What am I, what am I right. reading? What are these words saying? And I've just found that what you can say in two or three paragraphs, you can actually say in two or three sentences, if you have it structured correctly. And if you narrate it in a way where the reader goes, okay, they can figure it out in their mind. So um, that's something I've really tried to work on is, is not necessarily narrowing it down, but being able to be to the point, you know, if you're in Morocco and the wind's coming off of the sea, you know, and there's sea salt and all that, there's a way of saying it to where you're, you're painting the picture, you're illustrating the vision in the mind of the reader without going on and, and babbling on. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes, I do. So that's something I I've really It's, it's a stylistic on. thing. Yeah, yeah. It's a stylistic thing also. And kind of gets I mean, to there's the certain point a little. There are certain readers there, there are different sets of readers. There are sets of readers who really like to be soaked into the, soaked up by the environment. Mm -hmm. They want you to take them to that place in detail. And there are certain readers who say, just give me the watercolor version and I'll get it. So yeah, yeah, it depends on who you're writing for and what type of book you're writing. But in the thriller genre, it's, it's more action and a lot less uh, detail, a lot less, um, you know, uh, description. Yeah. I think, um, well, for me, I'm a visual person. So it, as I read something, I can visualize the scene in my head. So for me, I don't need a ton of detail because I can organically start to picture it. And that's how I can kind of tell uh, a good book. If I'm really going to enjoy it, if I can start seeing it as I'm reading through paragraphs, not everybody's necessarily like that. And to your point, they probably need more details. Um, but yeah, I think that's a big thing for me is being able to get into it, kind of get sucked in and start to see, you know, the, the scenes in my head and, and, and visualize it. Cause that's a part of the entertainment for me that I can see that. Yeah. I'm the same way. I'm very cinema oriented. I like to be able to, in, to, to envision what this person is, where this person is taking me, which is also why I kind of gravitate toward the writers who do what I do, which is go to the places that they're going to write about. I, I sort of have a rule that I won't write about a place I haven't been to. Now I break that once in a while, like, you know, COVID, I can't leave the house or whatever, but yeah, for the most part, I write about, um, if I'm going to write about a place, I'm going to go there. Yeah. How did your, um, time in the military help with writing some of the stories you've written so far? Yeah, I, I, it helped with everyone because, you know, it's write what you know. So the things that impact us the most are the things that we're going to write the best about. Uh, I suppose if I, you know, had not been in the military and had been, you know, in agriculture, then I'd probably be writing about, you know, farmers and farm life and stuff like that. But this, that's the stuff I know. So it's, it was a huge help. It's still a huge help. Like after I wrote, uh, in the company of heroes with Mike Durant, I don't know if you know who you remember from the Black Hawk down. Mike was actually 
yeah. the Black Hawk Down pilot who was shot down and captured in, in Mogadishu. And so obviously the fact that I had a strong military background, you know, brought us together and there wasn't a lot of, you know, there wasn't a lot of explaining needed to do. I mean, obviously he was a, you know, very experienced elite, you know, night stalker pilot. And I'd just basically been a passenger in Black Hawks, but I got it. You know, yeah. I, I was able to, so, and then after that we wrote the night stalkers and then I wrote this book. Uh, with uh, photographer Robert Cunningham called Afghanistan on the Bounce, uh, which is sort of a coffee table, sort of a, it's meant for civilians to understand what, you know, the journey of our people downrange has been. And so it helped with that too. So, I, you know, I, you will probably always incorporate your military experience somehow into, into what you write. And... Um, yeah, it's helped in every single book I've written. So when it comes to research, a lot of authors do research. They go on trips, as you've said, and, and they go to the places where, um, you know, they really want to go and get that first sight, line of sight vision, and then they can incorporate that. What do you do for research when it comes to some of these books? Well, um, like for my, my last, the series I'm writing now is all World War II stuff. So, first of all, I grew up around those people. I mean, I, you know, I was born in 53, so all my parents and their friends, they were all veterans of World War II. So, I had that taste and that culture from the time I was a kid. So, that's basic research is, you, you know, I don't have to study the culture of the 40s to get the tone right because I sort of was born on the cusp of that and it was still there. Right. Then... The places like um, France, or I was just writing about North Africa, Sicily, France, uh, Germany, all places I've been or go to, like for this book, for the last of the seven, the center of the book occurs in Sicily during the invasion of Sicily in 1943. So I just went to Sicily and stayed there for a while and, you know, stayed in the places I was going to write about. So that's that research. And then of course I do, you know, I do a lot of reading about incidents, uh, battlefield incidents, you know, wartime incidents. Um, there's a, in the last of the seven, there's a couple of chapters that take place aboard a hospital ship. Um, and I drew the true story of that hospital ship out of World War II. I don't want to, you know, give it away because it'd be a spoiler, but Sure. Very tragic story about this British hospital ship, the invasion of Italy, actually, which I transmuted to Sicily, but it doesn't matter. But So I was in Sicily. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Merchant Marine, and the rest was first and second hand research from archives and, you know, World War II British history uh, after action reports and stuff like that about those ships and what happened. Put that all together. And then it comes out pretty real. So let's. So that's sort of my. The, it's a mix. Okay, let's talk about the uh, the last of the seven. I'm going to read kind of the synopsis just real quick off of Amazon. Um, a spellbinding novel of World War II based on the little known history of the X Troop, a team of European Jews who escaped the continent only to join the British Army and return home to exact their revenge on Hitler's military. Where did, where did the idea for this kind of come from? Well, I knew about these guys because uh, when I was in the Israeli army as a young man, I was 24 when I went in, a lot of those guys who had survived this were still alive. So I actually, I, I didn't know anything about what had happened there at Tobruk and in North Africa with these guys, but I began to hear these stories so it had fascinated me over the course of my, you know, adult life and writing life. <clears throat> and then I wrote, um, first I wrote The Soul of a Thief. The Soul of a Thief is about a young Austrian kid who's half Jew and half Catholic. And he winds up, the way, the, sort of the way he survives the war is by getting recruited as the adjutant to an SS colonel. 
So that story, that story actually came from a great uncle of mine who went through that experience. He was, he was what's called a Michelin. He was half Jew, half Catholic. And he figured out the, the best way to hide in plain sight was to join the Luftwaffe. So he joined the German Air Force until they figured out like 14 months later and they sent him to a concentration camp. But he survived, so it doesn't matter. But at any rate, at the end of that book, sort of out of nowhere, Jeff, and this does happen, which you know as a writer, suddenly characters appear who you didn't intend to write, but you know that's, this is right, they should be there. And these seven British commandos in Nazi uniforms show up at the end of, of The Soul of a Thief, and I knew that they would be the heroes of my next book, The Last of the Seven. Okay. And then I... Uh oh, did I lose you? I can't hear you anymore. I'm sorry okay. about that. I don't know what happened there. I don't know either. Uh, you know, technology is awesome until it isn't. <laughs> Will you be able to edit? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's super easy. So yeah. Um. So we were talking about the last of the seven and kind of how you came up with the idea. You said that that group that appeared at the end of the last book was kind of like, oh, ooh, that epiphany you had said these guys would be going to be the heroes of my next book. Exactly. And then, and then you kind of went right into The Last of the Seven and a little-known history of the X Troop. Let's talk about them without giving away too many spoilers, but where did X Troop come from? Okay, well, it started with something called the Special Interrogation Group, which were um, a small troop of like 40... Um, European Jews, young men who had survived the Nazis, but their parents hadn't necessarily. So they were like orphans, right? Mm -hmm. And they all joined the British army to, to get back at the Nazis. And then in North Africa, this uh, sort of intrepid young officer named Bertie Buck, a captain who spoke like six languages, fluent German, came up with this idea that he would use these Jews, put them in Nazi uniforms, train them up as if they were Africa Corps, and use them to infiltrate Nazi lines. True story. Wow. Um, and these kids, these young men, you know, um, became basically super commandos. And, and there was an order called the Commando Befool by, by uh, Adolf Hitler that if they were to be caught, they were to be executed on the spot. So they were, you know, <laughs> these, these guys were pretty brave. So that was the, the sort of the, the formation of this, the, this idea that these refugees could be used against the Nazis. Later on in the European theater, after this group was um, sort of decimated in North Africa, which they were at the Battle of Tobruk, a lot of them were killed or captured. Um, the Brits had a number of commando units, one of which was, was um, number 10 commando and a subset of that was X Troop, and they again were British, uh, Jewish, German, Austrian Jews who put on Nazi uniforms to infiltrate German lines. So that's the that's the the sort of uh, kernel of of X Troop, the idea where that came from. It's all true stuff. So everything in that book that I recount in terms of what they did and how they operated, both the special interrogation group. And later on, as X Troop is all straight out of the archives. A lot of it was classified up until just a decade ago. Wow. So this is, it's not necessarily based on true story, but it's based on a lot of true events and true facts. Correct. You know, it's sort of classic historical fiction. You take the real events, real people, and then you add in fictitious characters who work through you know, who walk through that whole environment. The environment's real. Mm -hmm. um, you create a character based on maybe a compilation of real people or some of your own mates from, you know, the military or whatever. You sort of put them together and, and they are sort of walking through this true history, but they themselves are fictitious. Wow. I'm really looking forward to digging into it. It just sounds really, really interesting. Um, just the storyline of the X Troop and how they 
you know, came to be and what they decided to do. I think that's really cool. And anytime anybody wants to extract revenge on Hitler and Hitler's military, I'm all for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was a cool group. I mean, yeah. uh, it cool group. Cool. A, lot of, a lot of them died. A lot of them uh, paid the price. But, man, they did some crazy stuff. I'll tell you one story, which is really fascinating. Bertie Buck, uh, Captain Buck, and his, uh, his um, second-in-command, David Russell, who was a lieutenant, they, all, they both spoke like six languages, and they formed this troop up of, of these German and Austrian Jews, some Alsacian Jews, and they put them together at a camp outside Cairo, and they trained them with all captured German uniforms and German documentation, German weapon, everything. And then to, to prove that they were good, um, Bertie Buck and David Russell took three of them and, and went out into the Western desert and walked into a German army camp in their uniforms. The three younger guys went and got on the paymaster's line to collect their pay for the day. And um, Bertie Buck and David Russell went into the officer's mess and had lunch with Nazi officers. Wow. I <laughs> can talk about balls. And, wow. then the, and then they all left and, and high, higher command said to them, well, I guess you proved that you know what you're doing. And they said, yes. And that's when they assigned them their first missions. Wow. That's a true story. <laughs> true story. Whoa, that is gutsy. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah, really I'll, gutsy. Say, I'll say. It's almost uh, to the, you know, going in there and having lunch, like eating their food is almost, almost a little insulting, you know, like <laughs> it's hilarious <laughs> right. that they did that. I mean, getting the pay oh, yeah. is one thing. Yeah. Yeah. You took some of our money from us, but you ate our food. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, right. <laughs> you come in and had a meal with us. You broke bread with us. Like, man, that's a, uh, that's, yeah. that's good. I like that. They were, that's, they were gutsy. And in the officer's mess too. I mean, and in the really, officer's mess. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yep. 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 So the last of the seven is out now. Um, people can go pick that up and pre-order it, right? Oh yeah. It's been out for a while. It's in hardcover. It's not out in paperback yet because it's too new. And by the way, for people who like Audible, um, that book uh, is, is, uh, the audio recording is by Raphael Corkhill. He's this British actor, magnificent actor. I just saw him on, uh, he was on the FBI files the other night playing a villain, but he's been on the blacklist and he's really? been in a whole, whole bunch of movies and uh, he does an incredible job. This guy can do any voice, any accent. He's terrific. So uh, yeah, it's an audible and it's in hardcover and of course Kindle and so forth. Yeah. So now that it's out, what are you working on next? What's up um, next book, next novel? What's going on? Part three of the series. Okay. Um, so I, and I think I'll probably finish with part three, but that's a big book. Uh, the Soul of a Thief was sort of a smaller hardcover, and then The Last of the Seven was a little fuller. And this one is a four-parter. Um, it begins around Normandy and ends at the end of the war. So it covers quite a bit of ground. And uh, that's going to take me a while, but I'm, I'm into that already. And so uh, that's my next, my next chunk of time is working on that book. Anything uh, queued up or anything on kind of your plate for after that and, and what's going to happen in the next couple of years? Well, I, I also ghostwrite for some big celebrities. So I do that okay. on the side. Um, and I'm always sort of, uh, depends if I like a project, I'll do that as well. While I'm writing my own stuff, I'll write for somebody else. Um, but I think... After I finish this World War II series, I'm going to get back to the thriller genre and see. I'm interested to see, Jeff, how much the thriller genre has changed because it has totally changed since when I started in the 90s. Uh, you know that. I mean, I want to see what the pace is and what people are doing and what people want to read. That's changing a lot, too. The whole thriller genre is changing. Um, it is. Are you, going to, are you going to Thriller Fest, by the way? I am. Well, I'll see you there. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to Thriller Fest. I'm, I'm going to BoucherCon. I went to BoucherCon last year, and uh, that was a blast. I met a lot of good guys. Um, I talked to Kyle Mills a whole lot. Like, he was very, very open uh, with his time. That's cool. You know, especially at the bar at night. Like, he just talked and talked <laughs> and talked. And I was like, 
man, this is awesome. I'm not even asking him to do this. Like he's just, he was just spilling the beans and Simon Gervais, he was, uh, he was spilling the beans on it. He told me a lot about publishing that I didn't know, which I thought was really, really cool. And he didn't owe me that. He didn't have to do that, but he was super nice. And yeah, uh, that's cool. I met Don Bentley. I met Mark Greeny, Ward Larson, um, a lot of guys. I spent a lot of time just chatting with them. So I was like, yeah, I got to go to Thriller Fest and see if I can't learn a little bit more. And yeah, uh, those Andrew venues are Wilson. really good. Yeah. Those like venues are really good. There. Thriller Fest, I'm, I'm going to be. Um, the moderator for the historical fiction panel. So uh, make awesome. sure that, uh, yeah, let's make sure to get together. Yes, sir. I will for sure. And um, I'm going to give away uh, once I read through your book, I got two of them. I'm going to give them away. I, I, I like to uh, read through the books. I give the authors a review and then I give them to uh, other veterans who maybe can't afford books or, or want to get into them. So um, your book will go into good hands um, for sure. Once I'm done with it and uh, I give them out to the local VA and stuff like that. I appreciate that. I appreciate yeah. that. That's awesome. So yeah, we'll, uh, I'll definitely link up with you before Thriller Fest and we'll share contact info and then we'll link up, um, uh, at Thriller Fest and have a beer or a drink or something and we'll catch up. Outstanding. Well, sir. Sounds it was great. Absolute pleasure having you on today. I can't wait to dig into the last of the seven. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Feel free to reach out to me and it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Jeff, it was great. Thank you. You take care now. I'll see you soon. All right. You too.